Hey, welcome back to the show. Total Financial Solutions, Safer Money Hour. Air Fallaby and Jeff Gerard talking about your family's finances. Okay, if you ever thought or have been asked about or been the person, maybe you're the one asking, yeah. saying, hey, you know what? I need to borrow money. Look, I'm okay if that becomes the case. If you're the one lending money, are you prepared to never see that again? And... Are you man or woman enough to say, I'm not going to let that affect my relationship with this person? And here's the catch, the biggest catch. If you are married, is your spouse on board? Both in lending money and in the method or forms of collection, collecting it or not collecting it. It's often, um, it used to be really one-sided, Jeff. I would see sure. uh, the moms would be hiding money and giving it to the kids behind the dad's back, and the dad would be the stern one. You know, oh, you know, just make it on your own, son. Arr! And then the mom would be, uh, okay, Jimmy, here, meet me in the kitchen, and, and give them, you know, $100 behind dad's back or something. Well, you uh, knew my great-grandparents? Yeah. Wow. But today, I see it in both places. I see sometimes the women are hard and, sta uh, you know, hard and fast on the rules, and the men are, are soft, and then uh, vice, and ver vice versa. So I see it in both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, if they're not on the same page, then it creates problems not just between you and the relationship, especially if it's a child, but between you and your spouse. Your spouse, if you're doing the it's our money conversation, and that spouse has, has uh, not agreed to lend money or said, yeah, I'll lend money, provided that we collect it the way we're supposed to, then you have to decide what kind of a relationship is more important to you. That's right. And it's interesting you're bringing up that both sides could be affected. You know, on one on the, on the lending side, the spouse, of course, I would say, because you're taking away from money that really belongs to both of you. But even on the receiving side, if one, if only one of the spouses provided their, you know, it's a, it's a couple that's receiving this money. If only one of them's taking in the money and the other one doesn't know about it, isn't there a little bit more to the story potentially? Yeah. Now you're talking about communication issues and some intimacy issues that go well beyond the scope of this show, but I got it after hours. Just give me a call. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Uh, backline. <laughs> yeah, backline. Uh, the <laughs> overtime show. Go oh, financial solutions. Well, well, really what I mean by that to clarify is, you know, if, if I borrow money from you, Arif, and you guys are okay with it, uh, you and your spouse, and then my oh, spouse doesn't know, yes. did I involve my spouse? Does she know about it? Or That's say, right. Hey, Arif, you know what? I, yeah, I need, good point. I need, a, I need a, little, a little bit of help here, but don't tell my wife because, you know, what is it? Did I have my own credit card? Did I get into gambling trouble? Did I get into... So there's a whole host of things that could be underlying that I don't want my spouse to know about. And that could create some other problems, too. And have we not seen that time and again with people that run small businesses, that people that uh, where the same spouse that makes the money is the only one that talks about the money sure. and keeps the other one in the dark with just an allowance? There, These are conversations that you have to have uh, regularly with your spouse because one of you might die first. Did you know that? Surprise. Chances are one of you is going to die first. Now... That means that wherever the chips fall, right, wherever the money is, wherever the debt is, whoever owes what, uh, then there you go. That's, that's the way it is. I'll tell you a story. A gentleman used to lend money on a handshake to his friends. And he's um, born an, an immigrant, born in another country, came here legally, uh, grew his business. His wife became an educator. They became very successful, uh, if you will, in the world of, of money, that a home and a uh, couple of children, and they put it all together, and the husband would lend money, 2000 5000 and he said he would always be paid back, and if he wouldn't, that's okay. A very wise man, somebody that was very uh, even-tempered, you know, very, very straightforward, nice guy, never lent money that he couldn't afford to lose, but people always paid back. And then when he died of a, of a sudden heart attack and he passed away, there was still money outstanding and his wife didn't know who owed what or how much. And every so often, about every month, for over a year, the door would knock and there would be somebody at the front door that would say, I owe George this money. Here's $1,000. And as a widow, of course, she could use the money. She uh, was scared and trying to figure out life. But even beyond his passing... His judgment, his relationships were able to 
uh, continue to have dollars come to her. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? George, That's really nice. if you will, continue to, to pay. I'll tell you another quick story. We had another uh, client who passed away and had three children, and one of the kids were always, was always taking money, always borrowing money, uh, never paying it back, never. Just that's the way it would go. Well, they didn't know that the mom was keeping a ledger. <laughs> and when it came time, to, when she passed away, she did, and she was the last to, to pass away, there was a ledger, and it kept a list of how much money this other child had borrowed, and that was, via the instructions of the trust, taken off the inheritance right, at the, right off the top. Wow. So whatever he was supposed to earn, it dropped dramatically, and those dollars were now... Uh, as if taken and paid in full. Pretty amazing, huh? Because that was a definitely a shock to that particular child. You That's think, some oh, tremendous insight, too, on the side of the parent. You know, some people are so blind that they think, oh, well, it's all going to come out in the wash, or that was a gift to me. And But really, that's that's awesome. I think that's great. You see that with parents that understand their kids. And look, most all of you understand your kids. You've raised them before they could even open their eyes. You know who they are. You know if they have integrity. You know if they uh, say more than they can really do and all of that. You just may not want to see it. That's different. That that's not their problem. That's your problem. Yeah. So if you think that you're going to put expectations on a relationship that doesn't exist, you have to be very careful with that. Right? Those expectations could create a big problem later on. Here's one of the things that we want to talk about when we're setting terms for late payments or defaults. Now look, writing everything down and giving them time to sign off on it. And Jeff, you had a great suggestion. If they are married, if it's your son, then make sure your daughter-in-law signs off on it or vice versa, right? If it's your daughter, sure. make sure your son. Make sure they each know and all four of you or whoever's involved in this sits down at the table and says, me and your mom have talked. We've decided that we will lend you $50,000. It will pay off your student loans. It'll pay off your car. We're going to write the checks directly. Your payment was before $1,200 per month. We've done the math, and with very low interest, let's say 1% or 2%, more than we would earn at the bank, we're going to have a payment of $800 a month. You're like, yay! Hmm. But here's the catch, kids. You have to make a, check, uh, a payment out every month of $800, and it will come directly from your checking account. So what day do you get paid? Oh, I get paid on the first of every month. Great. Then we're going to take it out on the second of every month. And remember that $400 savings? $200 goes right back into your account. Yeah, spend it, do what you got to do, live. But $200 is going to be forced savings account. And me and your mom, it's a joint savings account. It's kind of our little backup. So you keep making your payments. You've come out ahead by $200, no problem. You're going to be paid off way sooner than you would be if you kept all these things together. However, that $200 to give you some breathing room, that's yours. That other $200 goes into the savings account. It's a joint savings account where two signatures are required to pull the money out, not one. And those dollars are going to be our little backup, our insurance policy. And what about life insurance? Should you take it on somebody who's making you payments? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. And, and really depends, I would say, on the amount of money that's being borrowed. Uh, because what you have to do is think of going back to one of our first rules is, you know, are you able to take all of the money you just lent out with hanging quotes as a loss? What if they, what if they pass away and you've made, you know, checks out to financial institutions, credit card companies, student loan company, it doesn't matter because the money's gone. And how are you going to recoup that if your child, God forbid, passes away? And you may be able to write off the loss on your taxes, provided that certain things were followed. Check with your CPA or your tax preparer because there may be something in your uh, you know, write-off ability, your taxes, that you say, you know, listen, I lent the money to my kids, and now they are, uh, you know, now they have some issues. So, You know, I think something else that's helpful, and, and someone told me this a long time ago. They were approached by someone uh, pretty close to them that wanted to borrow money. I think it was relatively small, but still a large number, in my opinion, about a thousand dollars or so. And, or maybe it was 2000 and they said, look, uh, I'll loan you some money, but I'm not going to give you a hundred percent of it. 
they made they only loaned them I think it was about a thousand or maybe fifty percent of what they were looking for and they thought oh well and then the person that was asking kind of felt a little weird like well thanks but I didn't quite get where I was going and then they laid out a plan where they said look you're going to do and very similar to what you said you're gonna also contribute to this pay what you were paying before but we're gonna accelerate this much faster and I think it was to pay down some debt so I think being creative you know it's not a, bl a black and white answer a yes or no uh, it can be augmented it can be adjusted to where some habits are built some insurance is put in uh, in your favor if you're the lender uh, and and you have the other person with some skin in the game and I think that makes a big difference in having this whole circle and this conversation complete on a good note versus yeah. sadly you know how many of these transactions go go sour and then the relationship goes with it imagine for a minute the feeling that those who lent you money imagine for a minute that feeling when you claim that you don't have move, uh, money for your children's food, uh, everything is bad, da, 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 and, and that relationship, that person steps up and says, I'm going to make sure my, my friend's uh, kids or my grandchildren or whatever it might be, I'm going to make sure they're taken care of. And a few weeks later, they see a picture of you on Facebook holding a glass of wine in, in a vacation spot. <laughs> or, look at my new car. Or, let me tell you about a great dinner I had at this very expensive restaurant in town. They're going, wait a second, I am, I am sacrificing and risking when I lent you money. Now, I'm not saying it, they should have that feeling, especially if you're making the payments on time and everything is good. Uh, what I'm saying is, if you're going to go out and borrow money, there has to be a contrition that is involved there. There has to be a period of time that you restrain, at least out of good character, at least out of a bit of decorum that says, I am willing to, to recognize that I mismanage my money so much that I must go and borrow somebody else's hard-earned money. Nothing wrong with that. I've had to borrow money from my parents before. I get it. We all have been there, probably. But I can promise you, not only did I pay it back, but today they're driving, well, actually, both of them are driving nice automobiles because of things that we were able to do. Right? There's a, con there's a, there's a turning point, and you have to know that, that it's their money, not your money. They worked for it. They sacrificed. They took a chance. They didn't go on that vacation so that you can go on a, so they can see a picture of you on a cruise ship, right? <laughs> and you just borrowed money and what the heck? Something's wrong. Well, and even if, oh, I won it in a card game or, you know, my, my best friend works for the, the cruise line and I got a discounted, that's all wonderful, but what does the optics look like? <laughs> Right? That's right. You've heard it with President Obama. He goes, in one second, I'm so sorry for the death of everybody. And literally, minutes later, they show him walking out dressed in, in a golf attire to go golf. Mm. Now, you can say, well, legally, morally, blah, blah. But what does it just look like? It looks like there's a, there's a lack of, of appreciation for what just occurred. So well, you said there's another president that did the absolute opposite with his golf yeah, in fact, George W. Bush, once the war started, never golfed again. He says, I have men and women in harm's way. I will not golf until I'm done with the presidency. That's pretty hardcore, man, compared to our current president. I think yeah. he's up to close to 200 rounds of golf. But it's the optic, like you said. It's a, it's a big deal, I think. Yeah. All right, so let's continue here. Uh, number four, uh, we talked about presenting what's called a unified front. What does that mean? It really means that you step up as a spouse. If you're going to enact some punishment, which is usually where it comes in. It's, it's a spanking, if you will. It's a financial punishment. Okay, son, you weren't, well, mom, but you don't understand. My daughter was sick and I had to take her to emergency room and the copay and blah, blah, blah. I understand, I understand. And you'll still pay a penalty. What do you mean? Well, it's a, it was due on the first. I know, but I'm going to pay you on the next check. Fantastic. So then you'll pay half a penalty because it's only half a month late <laughs> or whatever your rules have outlined. And, but dad, tough luck. You, you don't get that. If they are going to ask for money as an adult, then they take the responsibilities and the punishment as such. It's no fun. I don't know anybody that wants to be punished or spanked financially. It's a very crummy thing to go through. 
parking tickets, speeding tickets. We've all been different places, right? You know what that is. Well, and that's kind of our uh, our way of thinking twice about making that same mistake again. When you have to part from dollars and you hurt somebody in the wallet, as they say, that's probably one of the best reminders that some people can afford to take on because they remember that feeling of not being able to spend the extra whatever they used to spend that money on or, gosh, you know, we really have to hunker down this paycheck because, you know, I got a speeding ticket or whatever you fill in the blank. So that's a good reminder. And I think it's healthy for us too to remember that straying outside of the, you know, whatever the, the rules or the parameters were, that puts somebody else out. They're expecting that money on the fifth or the first, whenever it was. And if you don't meet that obligation, they're out that money. So I think it, it's kind of a two-way street there. You know, I, lo- I know a lot of parents that uh, after a particular age or after a, few, a particular set of circumstances charge their, their children rent. Mm-hmm. And they say, okay, well, you know, if you're not going to go to college and you're going to work, then you're going to pay rent. And there's different viewpoints on that. Um, I was raised differently. I was raised that this is our family home. And at any time you want to go, you want to come, you can. Uh, there's no fee or penalty. But there's a moral obligation to clean up around the house, to walk by when you see the electric bill, pick it up and pay it, uh, to, to do things that, oh, the house payment just came in the mail, pay it, right? Whatever it was that I could contribute uh, when, when, as an adult, I was still living at home uh, is what I did. And then I remember my parents saying, we don't want you to do that anymore because you're saving for a house, because I was, I wanted to be married. I said, but I wanted to move from my parents' house into my own house. I didn't want to rent. I'm not saying that's a wise financial move now as a more mature man, but that's what I said, and, uh, and that's what I did. I say, I'm going to rent. I, I don't want to rent. So I started saving and saving. Now, there are some parents that would still charge their child rent, but they set that money aside. They say, you know what? I, yeah, because I want them to get into the habit of paying for something and not taking it for granted and wonderful. Mm-hmm. So instead of just taking that money and the parents just spending it, I have heard and seen many occasions where they just put it in a savings account and it becomes a gift when the kids get married or when they buy their first house and it's, it's a monetary gift, sometimes a large, large sum of money and they give that to their kids. So there are times like that where you might uh, create a different scenario than what it first seems like. Like initially it's a rent and the mm-hmm. kids don't know that you're keeping the money. But that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about when the kids come to you, the adult kids or relatives, and say, I need money. Can I have money for what? Well, I need to pay off this. Well, what's going to keep this from happening next month? I don't know. Well, I'm not giving it to you. (laughs) You, If you come to me with a plan and you have a story and to pay it back, and that's this and this, then fantastic. But if it's because of a different story and you don't don't know the reason, you know... uh, did I work less hard for my money than you did? Did I sacrifice less? So there's a process there that you want to follow through. Well, I think you touched on something else important. You know, adult children that don't have that same uh, privilege that maybe you and I had where that was our family home as long as my folks were in it. Uh, coming back, especially if you're a plus one, you, know, you go out and you acquire a boyfriend, a girlfriend, maybe even a small family has started. And you get in that place where you have to move back into home because you had some financial trouble, maybe job loss, maybe somebody got sick. There's a whole host of things that can happen. But those same terms, I think those arrangements should all be treated as though it was not your child, as though it was not your family member or whomever it is, because that still puts you out. You know, just because you have, okay, it's just one extra mouth, right, that we're feeding. It's just one extra shower a day. It's just one extra, and you fill in the blank, one extra load of laundry. I mean, I've seen it. I have helped family members out, wonderful people, but there's a second layer there. You also have to have inside of those parameters, what does the end look like? Or is there an end? Some people do it indefinitely. So all these things are just really designed around helping you not have to face you know, that uncomfortable conversation one day where you've got to ask someone to leave your house or, hey, where's my money? Because if, if you don't want somebody around, you loan the money. If you, yeah. <laughs> I think you've said it best. Yeah. I, I love that. Hey, look, if you want to get rid of somebody, lend them money. Yeah. Because they'll avoid you. They disappear. And maybe it's worth it, right? Sometimes you think, gosh, I can get rid of that brother-in-law. It's only going to cost me $5,000. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then if you want to see somebody all the time and they're just not calling you, borrow money from That's them. That's right. <laughs> They'll be in touch with you pretty regularly. We'll be back in just a minute. Eric Hallaby and Jeff Gerard. You can reach out to us at 298-5487. Give us a call if you have a story about lending somebody money and it may not have gone so well. Or maybe 
Maybe you have a tip or a trick that we can use here on your place for news, talk, and information. I'm Eric Hallaby. This is Total Financial Solutions, Safer Money Hour. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Total Financial Solutions, Safer Money Hour. Eric Hallaby along with Jeff Gerard. All right, look, in your financial life, you may have to make tough choices now and again. It's, do you lend money to your kids? Uh, look, if you're going to follow very strict rules, if you would lend money under the normal set of circumstances, in other words, the job they have, the uh, the way that they are saving money, their habits, all of that. If you were just to have a stranger walk in off the street and everything else would be okay, and you'd say, yeah, I would lend money to that person. Oh yeah, if that person doesn't pay, I would evict them. I would repossess their car or whatever it is that, that would have. If you're willing to do those things, even if it's the relative, well, one, you might be a little cold-hearted, but maybe it's okay to do it. <clears throat> but I always say, people say, oh, oh, oh I want to, I'm going to have my daughter. She's going to move into my house, and, you know, she has three children, and she's just trying to get on her feet. So she's going to move into the house that I have out in the whatever, in the valley. Okay. Uh, what happens if she doesn't pay? No, no, no. She gets uh, child support and alimony, and she's got a part-time job, and she's going back to school. What happens if she doesn't pay? Well, you know, it'll be okay. She, she said she's going to. What happens if she doesn't pay? Now, she knows you as good as well as you know her. In other words, she knows that you're not going to follow through with the threat or you are going to follow through with the threat, whatever the situation is. She knows you're serious or she knows you're not going to be serious. So getting things in writing is important for a lot of reasons. One of those is you can become a creditor in the story in which she has a life, meaning... If ultimately she files bankruptcy, and then instead of you going in as a, well, I'm her mom and she owes me money, you say, I am a creditor. I am the same as Visa or MasterCard or the Ford Motor Credit or Honda Motor, whatever it is that she owes money mm -hmm. to, you are it. And that's important because you're going to need some legal protection. And that is that are things like the contract, that are things like... Um, the uh, the steady steady amount of payments and the history and the documentation that says on the first of every month she's been paying so it's a legitimate loan it's not a gift so those are important parts so that if you have to jump in line as a creditor you have a you have a legal background as much as a financial talk show guy can give you a legal <laughs> advice but you're definitely going to check with your your attorneys on this but it gives you a little bit better standing generally speaking well and it doesn't leave you hanging out to dry you know just like we talked about earlier in the show if you're the person that you loan money to were to pass away you would want some type of documentation saying hey look you know more than just a, you know a sweep out of my account going you know, Lord knows where, you know, left my account, here's this money, and I, you're going to go try to recoup it. The same thing is the case if they don't pay you back, you might have, of course, checking with your legal team, the ability to write that off as a loss. And yes, it's your daughter, yes, it's your son, or whomever it is that's close to you, you still have to have those those things in place because you can't just call up the IRS and say, hey, look, I'm just going to claim this on my taxes because, you know, it was my kid, but they didn't pay me back. You yeah, have that, all that. It, it's just best in your best interest to do it. So follow through on a few things. Number one is you're going to make sure that you have it in writing, whatever it is. Number two is you need to make sure that you can afford to lose this money, even if they know that you're not going to follow through or that you're going to blink at the last minute. You need to have in your possession something in writing, but be prepared early on to lose the money. If that's going to happen, if you're going to be able to lose the money and you're okay with that, then I'm okay with lending it. Uh, I had a, a friend years ago, he says, Arif, I need $10,000. Can you send me 10000 And he's uh, out of the country. He's overseas. And I, and I knew that I would never see the money again. Uh, oh, I'll pay you back, and uh, you know I have some collateral, and it's just for a short time. And so I was only comfortable with saying I could never see again a thousand dollars. I said, let me send you a thousand, and that's what I'm comfortable with. I didn't say, but that's what I would be okay with losing. Right? I was not comfortable with losing ten thousand dollars. And so I said, I can send you a thousand, and I don't know when the rest can come. He says, you know what? Never mind. Ooh. I said, oh. He said, he said I needed 10000 <laughs> Never mind on any. Uh, oh. Well, thank you. You just saved me $1,000. Yeah. Right? And that strained our relationship. I didn't ask him to ask me, but it strained our relationship for quite some time. Like, really? I, I didn't. I didn't. Why would it be my fault? So, keep in mind, if you're going, if you're somebody who needs 
to borrow money and you're you're going to go ask somebody then you better be very careful with that relationship you better you better overextend your ability to um, make sure you're doing the right thing with them and not not crossing that line and making a mistake, right? You know, sometimes it's the the time as well. You know, if you say, "Hey, look, I can loan you some part or all of it, but it, I can't do it until X amount of time." That might put some, you know, a safeguard in between because they might have exhausted some other resources, kind of like the never mind conversation. Or, hey, they really need it and they were willing to wait three weeks, a month, or whatever it took to, to put that together. So, And they might be willing to do some work for you. Yeah. Oh, well, I can come over and help. Great. So what is that worth per hour or per job? And if you borrowed X dollars, let's take it away from there. If I lent you 10000 and each one of these jobs is $500, then you have to do 20 of these jobs. And we write down the date and time. You sign it. I sign it. And it shows that they are working towards it. Self-worth is way more important than self-esteem. Remember, prisons are filled with people with self-esteem, but not very many with self-worth. Thanks for listening. Stay with us after the top of the hour. I'm Arif Hallaby. That's Jeff Gerard. We're going to continue with retirement trips, tick, <laughs> tips and tricks. <laughs> All right, braces are fun, folks. Well, we're going to be back in just a minute after the top of the hour. That's Jeff Gerard. I'm Arif Hallaby. We'll be back on Total Financial Solutions, Safer Money Hour.